Hey team, welcome back to another episode of the Strength Game Podcast. I'm your host, Nick O'Brien, and this is episode number 30. The Strength Game is a weekly podcast dedicated to discussing all things physical culture with the coaches, athletes, iron enthusiasts, and experts deeply embedded in the strength game on both sides of the profession, both as coaches and as competitive athletes. I want to thank all of you who have liked, shared, and subscribed, commented on the show. Your support allows us to continue to bring on expert guests and highlight more individuals in the strength game, just like our guests today. I also want to thank our sponsor, Cerberus Strength, for bringing you this episode today for free. Trusted since 2012, Cerberus is making the best strongman, powerlifting, and strength sports equipment and accessories, ensuring the ultimate competitive edge. Every one of their products is tried, tested, and proven by top-level athletes worldwide. So whether it's competing on the big stage at World's Strongest Man or training at home in the gym, Cerberus Strength Equipment is reliable, durable, and of course, strong enough to handle all your training goals and needs. If you're in the market for the highest quality strength and conditioning gear and equipment, be sure to check out CerberusStrength.com and use our promo code STRENGTH underscore GAME to save on your next order. And in this week's episode, I'm joined by Coach David Manning, good friend of mine out of Loyola. David is the head strength conditioning coach for the Loyola University Men's Lacrosse Program, as well as a strength conditioning specialist at Training House Gym in Baltimore, Maryland. In addition to his coaching roles, Manning is also the founder and owner of Peer Performance Lab, an online training platform specifically for lacrosse players and athletes alike. Originally looking to pursue a career in medical field, Manning shifting gears and kept involved in his other passion, lacrosse, coaching for multiple programs at different capacities, including Cambridge High School, Bridgewater College, Viewpoint High School, and for the Santa Monica Dragons, all while taking up an interest in strength conditioning on the side to where he finds himself today. Manning's coaching career is well suited for him after a highly successful collegiate playing career as a close defenseman at Loyola University on the lacrosse program where at his freshman year, he saw his team win the 2012 Division I National Championship and became a team captain his senior year, all right, all for a return to the Final Four. Following his collegiate career, Manning was drafted 43rd overall to the New York Lizards, has been a part of the Charlotte Hounds, the Atlanta Blaze, and the Philadelphia Barrage of the Major League Lacrosse. Following his professional career, Manning is still heavily involved in lifting and is using his own training to stay healthy, learn, and test out new programs before implementing them with his athletes and his clientele. I'm excited to have him on the show today to share with you guys today. So with all that said, let's get in the game with Coach David Manning. What's going on, everybody? I'm excited. I am joined by a friend of mine back at my former spot up in Loyola University, Coach David Manning. What's going on, man? Hey, how's it going? Good to be here. Yeah, I'm glad to have you on, man. I, I know that background, that familiar territory. You're up in my uh, favorite hideaway. Up I know, in, the uh, President floor. Suites. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You spotted it. Oh, I, I know that hallway pretty well. That was my, that was my go-to hideaway. And then uh, to watch... Fourth of July, all by myself watching the fireworks up there. That was my go-to. Spot. Oh, really? Oh, what yeah. Hey, you'll do it. Do it this year. You'll see it from every single. Uh, every you'll see it from the harbor. You'll see it from downtown. It's actually pretty cool. Dang, good suggestion. Hey, so I want to hop right into it. Um, kind of talk a little bit about how you actually got it involved in the strength game. Like, what sort of sports you play growing up? Obviously, you're big into lacrosse, but. What else did you play like growing up? How what got you involved in training and then leading to a career in professional lacrosse as well? Yeah, so um, you know I'm the uh, I'm the younger brother, so I have an older brother. I was four years older than me by uh, by age, five years by grade. So growing up, it was like monkey see, monkey do. So whatever my brother played, um, I kind of followed suit. So you know we were big into basketball. I'm from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, so I grew up being a big UNC Tar Heel fan. Um, Shout out Roy Williams retiring. Um, but so played basketball. That was probably my main sport until high school. Um, played soccer and then started playing lacrosse pretty late by the standards of like the Baltimore kids um, in this area. Like sixth grade was the first time I played organized lacrosse. 
Uh, but I fell in love right away. Um, and so going into high school, how I kind of got introduced to strength and conditioning was I played at Chapel High and we had, I think at the time, like four juniors and seniors that were committed to play at UNC. Um, and they had dads that, you know, played in the program, you know, back when they won the national championship in the 90s. Um, and so they were working out with one of the UNC Olympic uh, strength and conditioning coaches, uh, Steve Gisselman. And so I was lucky enough to kind of get, you know, thrown into that group, you know, freshmen, you know, this is fall freshman year, hadn't even made the team yet. These kids have no idea who I am. I'm been in there with a bunch of juniors and seniors, division one committed, and I'm working with a college strength and conditioning coach. So that was my first introduction. Um, and so from the get go, I was introduced to quality training. Um, and so I worked with him off and on, you know, all through my four years of high school, I probably owe him for, you know, the first introduction, you know, just the passion of it, because I saw how much that helped my game. You know, I'm a kid from North Carolina, not historically, you know, pushing out great lacrosse players. And so I knew if I wanted to get to the next level, play division one and beyond that, you know, I had to have something that just like stood out on the field and I had a good frame, good size, you know, decent skills. But what I really committed to was, you know, the weightlifting, um, you know, trying to add size. So, the first thing that you see, you know, is me on the field um, and I'm towering above everybody. So, you know, I really committed to strength and conditioning through high school. I saw how much it helped me get recruited, how it allowed me to gain confidence on the playing field. Um, and so, you know, when I entered college, I think that was, you know, kind of a chip on my shoulder, you know, haven't had him in my corner. Um, and so that's my first kind of, you know, intro to what strength and conditioning really was. Um, of course, we had the high school weight room where, you know, you're throwing a bunch of fives on the easy bar curl and you don't burn out. So we did stupid stuff, too. Um, but he really taught me what I needed to do. Um, you know, we would do some of the Olympic lifts. We would do sprints. We do, you know, hurdles. We would do, um, you know, all these power exercises, working on movement with little weight. You know, I'm leaving the session like, hey, like, can I go like bench press? Like, what can I do for chest? He's like, you don't need it. Like, you got what you needed and some good movement some sprint and some jump in, you know, things that I do now when I train kids, but you know, I'm still a dumb high schooler that I'm still trying to, you know, grow some biceps and, and create, you know, a good chest. And it's like all that stupid vanity, you know, lifting that honestly has no room in sports performance um, aside from maybe making you feel a little bit better about yourself. Um, but yeah, that's how I kind of got going. And then, you know, through college, um, originally wanted to go into medical school, um, started out pre-med, um, ended up doing five years at Loyola because I tore my knee my senior year, um, but left Loyola, I had a master's, or not a master's, a major in biology, a minor in chemistry, um, applied to medical school, it didn't work out, um, took the MCAT twice, didn't get in the first round, um, kind of had a year off um, where I went out to California, I lived in Los Angeles. Um, worked in the Valley for Viewpoint High School, coached lacrosse there, coached at a couple club um, teams, and then ended up applying to James Madison for their exercise physiology program. Initially thinking I was going to reapply to medical school. So getting a master's degree, um, bolstering the resume, reapplying, um, still going, you know, kind of the medical route. Um, but it was honestly maybe like two classes in that I kind of fell in love um, with ex -phys and what they were teaching us. And that was right when my pro career was starting up. Um, I had just got off my first summer with Charlotte Hounds. And so, you know, when I was looking at my own training, cause I always programmed for myself um, after college, I was like, Oh, like there's some principles here that I could apply and that I can improve my own performance and training to help my, out, help my own career out. Um, and so that's where I really started committing to, okay, maybe this is a path I want to go down professionally. Um, being a sports performance coach and, and learn more about strength and conditioning. So that's really where the love and how I got into this field came from was, you know, starting out in high school, being lucky enough just to have, you know, Steve Gisselman be my coach, just lucked out there, um, you know, saw how it improved my game, my career. And, you know, it's kind of something I want to give back to everybody because um, I saw the benefits it had on me. That's cool to hear. I, I know Steve pretty well. He, he came by Loyola, I think, while I was there. To, uh, I think he was in, like, tech sales. Now. I, he, I bought the VX Sport uh, GPS system through him. So he would come by. I made him lift with me, which he was pretty stoked about. 
I think yeah. he, he must have mentioned you too as well. He's like, he's around here somewhere. And, I think uh, it was in the training room. I remember going to the athletic training room and Dave Schaefer was like, is there a guy like Steve Gisselman that you know? He was just here. I was like, no way. <laughs> I can't believe I missed him. Yeah, and I, I missed him. I think I caught him once when he came out here because we bought the same system uh, for the football team out here in Fresno. And uh, he, he would come out here as well and visit a bunch of the schools on the West Coast that had it as well. And no, he's Steve's the man. He's yeah. uh, he, you could tell he's got some passion in him too. Like he's fired up the lift. He's fired up any anything sports performance now. Like working with that system, he's he's a good salesman too. So yeah, I, I need to get back in touch with him. Oh, for sure. I want to go. I'd rather go out and visit him now and go out to the New Zealand area. Though. Well, he's he's back in North Carolina now. Oh, is so, he? Yeah, he just had another kid. Um, they moved back to the area. But yeah, I mean, what a life, right? You moved out to New Zealand, like, because he's a huge mountain biker too. So I'm sure he loved that. That's awesome. That's cool to hear though. Like kind of just your start and everything and, and really falling in love with the process of actually training. And I mean, it's got you to the point. I'm, I'm sure you take a lot of things away from not only your time, unfortunately, like due to injuries, having to like work your way around it, but also, I mean, getting selected to actually get a ride to go to Loyola and then play professionally. I mean, there's a big step up from when you see college to the pro ranks. So, I mean, I mean especially like Fogos are huge. Mm -hmm. I feel like all those guys do is just like eat weights and then just grip it and rip it and get off the field. So yeah. you have to be prepared for those things, whether it's college, high school or professional. Um, what was kind of the transition, the biggest thing you kind of saw from going from college to professional and then I know we want to touch on it a little bit for the people that aren't really familiar, um, but what pro lacrosse is really in the States is a little bit different than like the traditional big three. So can you kind of touch on a little bit of like MLL, PLL, and even like NLL, like what, what it's like to be a professional in the professional league, what, what practice looks like, game schedule, travel, roster, money, all those things. Yeah. Cause, um, it's a little bit different than like pro baseball, pro football, pro hockey. Right. Right. Um, so that would be, you know, when we're talking about the transition is just, you know, the routine that you have to get in, in the pro leagues is a lot different. Um, and so when we're looking at, right. So we have the NLL, that's the professional indoor lacrosse league and that's spread throughout, you know, the North America. So United States has teams, Canada has teams. Um, and then we had, we had the MOL. And so that was initially established, I think like 2000, 2001. Um, so that was the professional lacrosse league. That's what I started in my first two years in the league. It was just the MOL. Um, and then you had Paul Rabel that started up his own league um, called premier lacrosse league. Um, and that was a little bit more travel based. So the MOL was traditional, like kind of like the NFL and MLB, uh, most professional sports leagues, you know, you had that city that you were anchored in, you know, I was with Charlotte Hounds and Atlanta, Atlanta blaze. Um, but the PLL was more travel. So they would take, you know, it was like seven, eight teams, random names, um, and it'd be tour based. So they'd go to a city, all eight teams would go, they'd play that weekend and they tour around the United States. Um, the issue with pro lacrosse has always been, um, A, it's, it's not something that's sustainable to do year round. Um, it's a league where I think my rookie season, I got paid like eight, 10 grand for, I think that season was 14 games, um, right? So you're gone every weekend. You're not practicing throughout the week. So you basically fly out Friday, you know, you practice Friday night as a team, Saturday morning walk through Saturday night game, go out as a team, fly Sunday morning. Like it's a weekend warrior kind of league. Um, and so it's just, it, it takes a toll. Like every weekend in the summer, you're basically gone. You know, you're not making tons of money. You're probably spending all that money that night out. Um, so you basically do it because you love the game. You want to keep competing. You want to have, you know, that team structure where you're in a locker room and, you know, you don't want to give that up after college. Um, that's what kind of keeps you going. It's, it's never been for the money. Um, but that's what the PLL kind of tried to change. Um, they were looking at creating a league, which, you know, pays their players a fair enough salary that, you know, maybe someday it's, you know, it's a year round thing. But right now, every other player has, you know, a different job. Um, and that's what makes it kind of hard. Like there are some jobs that, you know, you can be, 
professional lacrosse player, it, it just complements it. Like a lot of college lacrosse coaches, you know, play professionally because um, they're still in the sport, still in the field, coaching, their minds in the game. They can use those facilities. Um, they can even train with their team at times to get ready. Um, but, you know, I had a bunch of friends that were, you know, working Wall Street and, you know, they're waking up at 6 a.m. throughout the week trying to get runs in, trying to get lifts. And then they work, you know, eight to 12 hours a day. It's like your bodies are beat up. It's just like that kind of lifestyle doesn't complement being a professional lacrosse player in the summer. Um, and so that was the biggest thing the PLL kind of tried to do is, is create an outlet um, to allow players to kind of just focus on lacrosse. Um, and then most recently, this offseason, the PLL basically acquired the MLL. They called it a merger. Um, the PLL bought out the MLL, basically took one of the teams. So now I think it's like eight teams. It's back to having, you know, just eight professional teams, which is the way it was when I left college. Um, but yeah, things are, it was a little bit of chaos in the professional leagues the last two years. There's, there's a lot of um, kind of competition between the MLL and the PLL. There's a lot of bitterness in between teams and players. And it was, it was kind of interesting. Um, but I'd say the transition is like you, your training is basically all on you. Right. So in college, you have a strength and conditioning coach, you know, you have organized practices throughout the week when you leave and you get drafted by a team and you're on a professional squad, like you don't see them until Friday night. And so what you do, you know, when you get back home Sunday through Thursday is all on you. You have to either hire your own trainer. You have to find, you know, um, teammates, friends, old players that are around to practice with. Um, Cause otherwise you're not going to see any kind of live practice until Friday night. And so it just adjusts your routine and the habits that you have to make to, to be successful. Um, and it's only, you basically have to have a job that allows you to have the time to do that. Um, and I think that was different the last 20 years, you would see a lot different makeups of teams and different players that were succeeding at the next level. It's just they kind of based on what you want to do at post-college. Do you want to, you know, go down the career path or did you want to chase the dream of, you know, playing lacrosse a little bit more? Um, it's kind of tough to juggle both right now. Yeah, you could kind of see that. And um, at least from the outside perspective or knowing a few guys on different organizations, you could almost tell who was going to win. And just based off of how they kept people in-house, like I know as soon as the machine, like when Ohio started working with the spot athletics and they actually had a professional strength coach, they had a site that they could go to, the the company – had basically bought them memberships to go and they were training in small groups based off their work schedule. I was like, they're going to win this year. And they yeah. did. And then like the lizards were like that for a while. And the Bayhawks felt like that because all the guys were in the hub. They were like in the right, DMV all, area. In Baltimore, yeah. And like Atlanta, I saw, I was like, there's no way this is going to work. None of the guys live in Atlanta. Yeah. yeah. And Florida was kind of the same way. And I mean, you also see that, like you said, with the differences between guys having different careers. I mean, some guys are balancing a nine to five job. I know like the difference between like when I was training Fletch and um, Frazier, like Fletch was already at campus and he had kind of the coaching role when he was doing his Dobo duties. And, and he then, could jump into practice. And exactly. Like and then Frazier was like, I got to bring my suit with me because I have to go downtown right after and I got to shower here. And he's like, I can't be late. So yeah. like, and then you could kind of see the demeanor, the differences between them just based off like the different stresses they have there. Do you see any sort of positives from this format or like how, how does this kind of affect on field performance? Because these are things that you can kind of preach to your high school and like younger and even college athletes that the things that you don't have control over, like class schedule, um, stresses in your life, like you can have control over a lot of things and all these things will play into your performance on the field. Right. Totally. Right. Stress is stress, whether it's physical, emotional, whatever, right. It affects you. Um, I think it's definitely decreased the level of play that you see on the weekends in the professional leagues. Like if you had these teams, these players practicing four days a week and they were able to just to focus on performance and eating right and recovering, like my God, the quality of the product that'd be on the field would be ridiculous. Like it's already ridiculous because they're highly skilled and you know, it's that skill. Like you don't lose. You still, you have that situational IQ and understanding where you can kind of ball out and play no matter what, 
but it would just be at a next level if they were able to truly commit for another five, six years post-college at developing their craft. Um, I think only a very few are allowed to do that. And those are the guys that basically created like lacrosse companies um, or, or coaches like Deemer class comes to mind, Matt Dunn, um, obviously Paul Rabel has always been in a kind of like lacrosse world. Um, Kyle Harrison, like guys that have lasted for a long time that, have just allowed them their careers to be in the game of really just perfecting their craft. And, you know, that complements their coaching, that complements their business and it complements their game. Definitely. I like how you said it complements it because I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons for the podcast, like why I started it, because I think a lot of the coaches that are actually still involved in training or finding new outlet outlets to compete, like, yeah, it, it does take up your time, but it definitely complements the product that you can give to your student athletes, which, I mean, anything that you do, if you're reading a book, if you're listening to different stuff, if you're having conversations with people, if you're steadily improving that, that just gives you a better product that you can give your athletes. So playing professionally yeah. is, is no different as long as it doesn't take away from it. And the format it is right now is, is, is actually pretty forgiving on coaches. Oh yeah, totally. Totally. Right. You can only ask so much. <laughs> you have them for two days like you don't have much control it's like just let them play like for sure. that, there's not that much coaching that goes on hey so you're you're pretty young into your coaching career and obviously you touched on it a little bit with um kind of switching gears and actually going away from the medical field but i mean for for most people's like sake you probably took a lot more in-depth classes like biology classes and like different um, anatomy classes as well. And then you got your master's like on top of it to add. So did any of that sort of training and like kind of education system serve you any benefit, like and prepare you to handle some of these situations? Cause I, as well, I want to touch on like you did suffer some injuries. So mm -hmm. having some sort of introduction to the medical field and then being ready for a strength conditioning profession, you have some knowledge. So what were you been able to take away from your education that's kind of helped with the injury process? And then you can also now help with athletes that you have that are dealing with situations with injury. Yeah. Um, I would say like biology always interests me. Like ever since high school, like I wasn't a big academic. I mean, I probably didn't take school too seriously until junior year. And I started getting recruiting letters and I was like, Gail, Penn, Dartmouth. My parents are like, well, you better start studying you idiot. <laughs> like, All right. Yeah. Um, but like since freshman year of high school, um, I had a great biology teacher and, you know, my dad's in the medical field my mom's in public health. So, um, science has always been something that fascinated me. And so I wouldn't say it was anything that I learned. It was more that, you know, when I got into grad school and we had our first week of classes, I was basically going over the syllabus and we were breaking down, like, you know, how the body just reacts and responds to training and how it's just, you know, it's always trying to return to homeostasis, right? So it's its own organism that you have all these inputs and stressors and based on those inputs and stressors, like it's going to adapt in a certain way. And like things just started clicking right away where I was like, wow, this is fascinating. Um, so it wasn't really anything I learned previously, although I mean, it helped me understand the information a little bit better and quicker. Um, but it's always been something that excited me, um, the science uh, side of things. And so just learning, you know, in depth, you know, physiology, just, you know, how we activate muscles, you know, how we stimulate a contraction, um, you know, how there are different kinds of hypertrophy and, you know, there's different physical qualities that you can train and how specific you need to be. Um, just having all the information and then, you know, looking back on my experiences, you know, I think knowledge is great, but then, you know, what's, what's the expression? Like once been twice shy, like it's those experiences that you learn a ton from, especially those negative ones. Um, that's where my injuries have, you know, kind of come in was, you know, for the most part, like I've been a pretty injury prone athlete, um, like blew up my knee, my senior year, had to get my meniscus repaired, my right knee, you know, the following year, come back for a fifth year. I tear my left meniscus three times, like, you know, second year in the league and I start getting shoulder issues. You know, when I'm in Atlanta, I get Achilles tendonitis in both feet after training camp, like just shit. That's like, you know, stayed with me throughout my career. But it's like, you know what? I could learn from that. Like now I know what a hamstring and Achilles, you know, 
a knee surgery feels like and what the injury process is. Um, I get the athlete mentality behind it. Like that senior year, like you kind of go to some dark places when you get your senior season stripped from you. It's a nine month recovery. Um, you know, I was on crutches for two and a half months, non weight bearing, which is more than an ACL surgery is like the amount of atrophy that was in my leg was disgusting. And so like you, you get that emotional response and that's something that's been allowed me to connect with athletes later on. It's like, look, I've, I've went through some serious stuff. Um, I get what it can do to you, but I can also see the light at the end of the tunnel. Like I made it out of it. I was able to play three years professionally on top of all these surgeries after four knee surgeries. And so it's like, yes, it's tough. It sucks at the moment, but as long as you double down, you know, you're consistent with your rehab, you're attacking it. You still have that goal at the end of my, you know, goal in your mind, you're going to be fine. You're going to get through it. Um, it just allows me to coach athletes a little bit better. Um, haven't been in those situations myself. Yeah. I mean, I can completely relate to that. I mean, dealing with my own injuries that kind of cut my poor career short and still kind of lag on to me, at least it, it gives you a little bit of connection right away with the athletes and some buy-ins. Like I'm kind of a broken toy so I can tell them like, Hey, this is, this helped me in this situation. Even if I don't know if it's the right way to do it, I can say, Hey, this, this helped me for it, or this is kind of the mindset I have for it. And you can kind of walk them through the scenario and almost speed up the process a little bit mm -hmm. to where you have someone on their side. That's not just kind of treating an injury. You're treating the person a little bit better. And that's, that's kind of the one thing that I see or have issues with people that are just like, Oh, diagnose this. It's like this knee issue is this timeline, this, 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 like, well, how does this person actually feel about it? Like, what can we actually do for the process? Do you have any sort of like, is there anything psychological or on the mental side, like dealing with these injuries and situations that um, you kind of use as more of a tool in the rehabilitation process? Or have you had any issues with like career ending injuries where you're trying to pull someone out of the dark and they really can't see the light at the end of the tunnel because now their career is stripped? Right. Um, thankfully I've not dealt with that situation, you know, grinding injuries. That's tough. Like thankfully no player I've, I've been with has went through that. Um, as far as, you know, just mental strategies. Um, cause I think you've probably seen it like, especially freshmen that get injured early on in their college career. Like they can kind of get stuck on that Island and become isolated from the team. They're in the training room when people are in film or in practice and, you know, they come back late, especially when you start out your career injured. It's like you see all the conditioning that they do. It's like, oh, that sucks. And then you get thrown into it and everybody else is in shape. And you're still trying to catch up and, you know, um, understand the speed of the game and uh, try to get yourself back in shape. Like it's tough. It's tough. Um, and so, you know, not to I just tell the you know, people that are injured, but like even freshmen in general, it's like there's going to be times where like you don't want to go to practice. You don't want to go – play you don't want to go lift like you don't want to go to class like you're going to get burnt out because now this is your job i guarantee you have not trained this hard and been this committed to something you know all through high school like the college games some it's it's different it's different um there's going to be times where you're burnt out especially late in the season but it's like, like finding that motivation understanding why you came to campus why you chose to play this sport um i think john gordon does a great job of you know talking about how to get out of you know being burnt out it's like you know rekindling that passion by figuring out, you know, why you fell in love with it in the first place. It's that kind of like mindfulness and visualization, I think goes a long way with athletes. Um, we've worked on it a little bit, try to do some like breathing exercises, some visualization. Um, Cause I think that's, that's part of the mental edge that doesn't get addressed enough in sports performance. Like, yeah, we're trying to make them resilient um, physically, um, you know, trying to improve speed, power, rate of force development, like all this stuff. But you know, if they're not mentally strong enough to execute that on the field, um, you know, at the end of the day, what are we doing? We're giving them things that they can't utilize effectively. Um, and so building up that confidence, that mental resiliency, um, like that's a whole another thing that we could go into is like what truly is mental toughness, you know, is it context specific, you know, what truly transfers, um, you know, how do we get them to execute at the, you know, in most important moments of the game? Um, and what goes into that. Um, 
And, but I truly believe like visualization, mindfulness, you know, trying to tap into that zone state. Um, I think George Mumford had a great book, The Mindful Athlete, that I absolutely love that, you know, I read probably every preseason going into my pro career was just learning how to clear my mind, um, you know, not ruminate on past mistakes, stay in the moment um, and try to, you know, tap into that flow state where, you know, I'm not reacting, I'm responding. I'm, you know, I'm being intentional with everything I do. And, you know, I can kind of read plays a little bit better because my mind's in the moment. Um, I think that's kind of the next avenue in sports performance is, is teaching athletes how to do that for themselves. Because that's difficult. That's a personal thing. Um, you've got to figure out how your mind works and, you know, how you get yourself into that zone. But everybody knows every athlete's felt that at one point in their lives where like things just click and like things start moving a little bit slower and like you just feel like you you command the moment of the game. Um, but how do we get them into that state more and more often? Yeah, no, that's a great point. I, I, I completely agree. I have to read that book, but I think those things are definitely some edge work stuff. And that's that's the same thing we call it here, like whether whether you're doing stuff outside of the weight room or basically all the things that kind of encompass what makes you a successful athlete. Can you do those things? And then can you take a step above and do the edge stuff? That's actually going to take you over the edge, but you kind of touched on all the, all the different methods that you can actually do. And, and you said it yourself, they're individual for each person. Are there any practical approaches that you use to try to do any of these things or implement them with your team? Or like you said, are these things that you're having like short conversations with guys individually because like they're so unique to the person themselves, or are you just kind of shotgunning it and then see if it catches on with a few guys and the ones that doesn't, you can kind of talk to about a different method maybe later. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think there is a type of player that's going to be much more open to it. Um, and they'll be able to figure that out for themselves pretty like quite easily. Some players it's just not going to work with. Uh, but I think, you know, interventionally, things that we can do is, you know, just practicing breathing, clearing your mind. Um, you know, I really like doing like static mobility flows where like it's seamless transitions in between stretches and, and movements where, you know, once you learn that, it's like before practice, just let yourself get into this flow of movement and, you know, figure out the plan for the day and, you know, how you're going to play. Your mind's not thinking about class or, you know, any stress that's at home or anything else external. It's, you know, here and now preparing your mind for practice. Um, I think doing some sort of flow like that before you get going, you know, kind of primes the mind to be ready to tap into that. Um, so that's probably the one intervention I have in my back pocket that I like to do, but it's a lot of conversations, you know, we try to create our own culture in the weight room um, that complements, you know, the culture that coach Toomey runs here. Um, with the program, but, you know, we have Monday motivation days. We have Wednesday wisdom where, you know, it's either me talking or I assign that to a player. And, you know, we try to create that, that culture where, you know, we're, we're able to open up a little bit more. Um, I think you, you know, Loyola, you understand, like we have that retreat weekend. That's huge for our teams where we go out uh, to Western Maryland, basically, you know, we're in a lodge for the weekends and it's more like opening up and getting to know each other um, personally. And we missed that this past fall because of COVID. And being a player for five years, like that was a weekend that went a long way for me. I think it made our team tighter, um, created the right kind of culture, created an identity on our team that we could carry throughout the season. And so trying to create that, you know, before lifts and give them an opportunity to get to know each other a little bit better. Because it's tough right now. Like our freshmen can't hang out with our seniors outside of practice time because we're all in our own little bubbles and pods and we're trying to limit contact tracing. And so that's been something this year where it's like, yeah, like we want to get, you know, the lifting in and the running and the, you know, working on physical qualities, but like if I have time to address, you know, the culture part of it, the off the field stuff and give them time to come together a little bit more. Like, I think that goes almost farther than, you know, the lift sometimes. No, I completely agree. Uh, that is one thing that, I thought we did really well at Loyola. And um, the first time we did it, I like kind of just didn't understand what was going on until we actually got everybody together in the room and kind of went over things, talked about each other's goals, kind of opened up a little bit. But it's cool to see, and I don't know if you were doing this before COVID hit, but it's cool to see that like throughout the rest of the season, 
you kind of touched on it daily with little, little, little things, either you leading it or assigning stuff to players where they can kind of lead it. And um, you said it like really well where you guys are trying to create a culture in the weight room, but at the same time, it complements what's being done on the field. And I think you're in a very unique position for most people because you played, you're playing for the same coach, you're playing for the same university now that you're coaching for. So you kind of have a little bit more buy-in with that. Do you have any more, would you have any advice maybe, like since you're in a unique perspective for someone that is, most people are not going to play for the coach that they're going to coach for and actually be on their support staff. So do you have any advice for anybody to like kind of maybe speed up the process or get to know that coaching staff and understand their culture a little bit better so that they can create a culture in the weight room. And then again, so that it complements what they're doing on the field without overtaking it. Yeah. I think you, you just got to create a relate relationship uh, relationship with the coaching staff. Um, I think it was a seamless transition for me coming in because the only coach that I hadn't worked with was our offensive coordinator. Um, you know, Coach Dwan, Coach Toomey, um, Coach Vakeness, they were all there when I played for five years. Um, our director of lacrosse operations was a player that was two years younger than me, that was a teammate. Um, and so our entire staff is alumni, basically, except for our OK coordinator. Um, and so, yeah, like I already knew the culture coming in. Like I knew how to, what to do because I've, I lived it for five years. Um, and so, I mean, if you're coming into a new organization, like I feel like you have to spend time to understand what that coach is all about. Um, you know, what makes him tick, what, you know, frustrates him, what he loves, you know, maybe some of the areas that they lack in understanding, like how can you improve that? Um, but I mean, honestly, I would just say take them out for beers, food, try to get lunch with them once or twice a week. Like just pick their brain better that better, you know, them, um, the easier it is for you to understand what kind of culture you need to create that the kids are already used to. Um, cause that's the big thing. If you have two contradictory kind of things going on within a program on the lifting side. And then, you know, from the sports coaches, like that's just, at the end of the day, you're not working towards the same common goal. Um, which everybody should be doing in the program. Yeah, definitely. I mean, because at the end of the day, if if that's happening, you're pulling the student athletes in opposite directions, and yeah, they have no idea who to listen to, or what to do. Oh, but but we know who they will listen to. It's the person that decides playing time, so it's always going to be them. So, for any coach to think that their culture in the weight room is more important than what's being done on the field is should not be in the profession and, and will likely be out of it pretty quickly. And I'm a hundred percent certain of that. Oh, hundred percent. Hey, so kind of going circling back around to like actually your coaching career and everything, like for most people that don't know Loyola, um, there are two sides to the university for athletics. And one side is on a hill by itself and it's its own little Island. And the other side is kind of run like a normal university and the other side for strength coaches is basically contracted through the sport coaches for their own desire. So in addition to being the head men's lacrosse strength coach at Loyola, you're also a strength conditioning specialist at a private gym training house. And then you're also the founder of your own performance um, company, per, uh, Peer Performance Lab. Can you touch a little bit on like the differences that you have, you see between maybe your gen pop, your high school athletes and then your collegiate athletes. And what are some of the similarities you see since you're coaching all of these people? Yeah. Um, so it's a very unique, unique position to be in. Um, so working with Loyola, obviously I get my hands on about 50 elite college athletes. Um, but then working in the private sector, I have, you know, from fourth, fifth graders, middle school athletes to high school, college pro older individuals that are just looking to get a sweat and, um, just li live a healthy lifestyle. So, I mean, the range of individual I'm working with, um, it's, it's quite a big disparity. And so what that challenges me to do is like be creative, understand which, you know, subpopulation needs what. Um, and I think, you know, one of your questions later on, is like, how do you differentiate training youth, high school, college, pro, whatever? It's like, well, it's what's the lowest hanging fruit? Because I think a big thing is being efficient with our time. You only have so much time with your client, your athlete, your team. You know, what's that lowest hanging fruit? Like, what's the best bang for your buck that if you can put in there, right, you're going to fill as many buckets as possible. 
Um, and so working with all those different kinds of, you know, athletes, clients, you know, people with different goals, um, ambitions, um, it makes you really question like, all right, what are we doing each session? Um, are we getting them to their goals? You know, is it, is, is this the most efficient path to get them there? Um, and every, everybody kind of changes and, you know, I may have a youth athlete that really needs a lot more work on movement quality. It's just coordination um, where, you know, maybe there's a fifth grader or sixth grader that, you know what, he's a stud athlete, like great genetics. Like this kid could probably start learning how to move some weight. You know, it's not, there's nothing set in stone at any age. I think you really have to kind of play it off like where this individual is um, in their life and what they need. Um, and so that's, what's challenging about working in the private sector. Um, but it's also great. Like I get my hands on a couple pro athletes every year. Um, you know, I get to work with college kids. I come home from winter break. Um, so my reach is huge, which I think is really important. It allows me to have my hands on a lot of athletes, um, and have a large impact, which is why I came into the field, um, was to influence, you know, as many individuals as possible. And that's what pure performance lab allows me to do remotely now. Um, so that's a website, that's a, um, that's a program that allows me to train individuals all throughout the country, uh, mainly in the sport of lacrosse, but, um, you know, it just allows me to expand my reach, my impact on this sport. That's cool to hear. I mean, that's, like I said, you're pretty young, like in the coaching career. I mean, you've, you've been playing, you've had a lot of exposure around coaches yourself. And then even on like the lacrosse sport coach side before you became a strength coach, so you're no stranger to like what actually needs to be done, but you're kind of like speeding through what most people would do for like an internship, an internship, a GA and everything. Because of my fire so far this year. Exactly. <laughs> like not just COVID and like college training and the world, but like, yeah, everything it's, yeah. But I think that's how you learn the quickest is you kind of get thrown into it and like, all right, figure it out, you know, keep your no. head above the water and just survive. Yeah, for sure. And uh, so I kind of want to touch on a little bit, like you said, you alluded to like one of the questions I did have for you. Um, what are some of the differences you see? Because like you said, you're working with some young players and they might have picked up lacrosse. I want to use lacrosse as as an example because I'm like, that's your specialty too. Um, so like working from like maybe a middle schooler versus a high schooler or youth athlete, college versus pro, like what are some of maybe the differences, either progressions, exercise selection, frequency of movement, or even like basically everything that you would put into a program. What are some of like the primary differences you see between like those four different um, levels and skills? Yeah. Um, so let's start with youth. Um, I made some posts about it recently, but I think when I'm dealing with like middle school athletes, like kids, very low training age, they're young. Um, what we do a ton of is like PE stuff, like games, task oriented activities, um, especially. So I started training a lot of, you know, kind of that population this fall. And I'm just looking at the situation, you know, schools are locked down, virtual learning. They don't have PE. They can't go outside, play with, you know, friends and like the neighborhood kids. Um, and so just the basic movement that they used to get, like just jumping off a swing, you know, playing four square hopscotch, like things where they're getting good ground contacts with the ground. They're jumping, they're running, they're hanging, crawling, like all the things you do in play normally A is, you know, getting taken away because school's virtual. They're stuck inside. They don't have people to play with video games. is already a large part of their life. So that takes, you know, part of that just fundamental being a kid playing outside takes time away from that. Um, and so what we do a lot of, it's like, it's kind of unorganized. It's, you know, we do a ton of things where we have a med ball, you know, we call it med ball bowling. Like we'll have like these big red pylons, we'll stack it up like pens, you know, we'll do different throws and they're not focusing on throwing a med ball. Um, you know, it's not like I'm having them do like a side hip toss or a dynamic push press throw or like an overhead reverse toss. Like they're doing that throw, but all they're thinking about is, you know, knocking over the pins. So giving them a task to do but we still get some good movement quality. We're still teaching, you know, kind of the fundamental movement patterns. Like it's almost like what sports coaches call like hidden conditioning. Like it's kind of like hidden teaching there. Um, put them through games that they're just having fun with, but they do get something out physically. Um, that's what I kind of primarily focus on from like middle school youth level. Um, I think as you transition to the high school level, like, yeah, strength, you know, 
the primary movement patterns, push, pull, hinge, squat. Um, I don't, I'm not a big believer on, you know, percentage-based programming with that level. I think, honestly, once you perfect the movement, you know, you start with lightweight, make sure they move good, throw a couple fives on every other week. Like it's, it's, it's more progressive like that instead of like, Oh, we're going 65, 68, 70%. They were bumping up two and a half percent every week. Like to me, that, that athlete probably doesn't know how to contract and utilize their whole muscle mass. How do I know that one RM that we calculated, you know, is really true. Am I holding them back? Am I progressing them too far for this percentage based program? And so for these high school athletes, you know, we always do some movement, you know, we always sprint. I think developing speed is huge at that age too. Um, but then just from a strength, solely strength programming, like it's really basic, really basic with these kids. You load up those four movement patterns, add some weight on or add a rep every week. And that's all we do. Um, I think things get more complicated. Um, the higher up you go, um, you know, the higher training age you are, right. The more adapted, you see more kind of training methods and styles like, yeah, that's when you can get a little bit more fancy with it. Um, but even, you know, we're, we'll move to college right now. Like I have three groups going at Loyola, you know, I have my freshmen, uh, maybe some sophomores, like they're in our basic group, group one, um, where they can just benefit from just general strength and conditioning, like basic movement patterns. We do some one by 20 work, um, to add on some hypertrophy, uh, but it's very basic. Like we picked the lowest hanging fruit for them, which is just like general strength programming um, and introduction to power work um, where like my group two is like still can get a little stronger, but now we're focusing on speed, speed, strength, rate of force development, um, creating that, you know, those elastic qualities, you know, fine tuning their program a little bit more. Um, and our last group is guys that are like, kind of like meatheads. Like they are strong enough. They have enough muscle mass. All we're working on is speed and rate of force development. And so once you get higher up in the college level, like you're going to see the disparity in training age. You know, some kids have lifted all through high school. Some never touched a weight. Um, and so we try to be specific, which, you know, group that we put them in. Um, so they're getting the most out of our program. And then from a professional level, like what I found my, myself um, just training over the last couple of years, you know, being bang, banged up from some injuries, but. I think once you get to the professional level, like at some point, unless you're truly the luckiest person out there, like you're going to get some injuries. Um, I really have to be, I have to be smart with when I choose my high days. You know, if I have a real high intensity day, like that takes a lot out of me. Um, you know, is that because I'm getting older and I'm banged up and my body's like, all right, like that's a lot of impact. I'm not sure we could do that more than once a week or it's just, you know, once you get to a certain training age, you know, is your nervous system that good at contracting your whole muscle, right? Like, so you have all those neural alterations, you can hit those high power outputs. So when you do train for power and have a high intensity day, like, yeah, like you're kicking the shit out of your body. You need time to recover from that. I think the higher you go, you know, if, as long as you have a decent training age and training history, like it's, you got to be really smart with when you give these guys a go day. Um, a lot of it's maintenance, prehab, just making sure they're healthy so they can still work on their craft and just play on game day. Um, at least that's from my experience. Like, it's almost like survivorship. It's like, just allow their bodies to feel good. They're not really tra uh, chasing any crazy strength or power gains. It's just like, let's just make sure they're able to play on game day once you hit that professional level. I think that's the most important thing. Right. Step in career. <clears throat> no, that's a good point because by the time you're at a professional career, there's no like step above that. So really you're just trying to, you're, you're in the game. So now you're trying to sustain it as long as possible, as long as you want to play. So there is sort of quote unquote, like maintenance work that's being done. Like you're, I mean, we understand your skill level is what's got to stay. Otherwise you're not going to be able to play. Like the physical demands are still there, but you have a training age that you can rely upon. And that's why it's really cool. I wanted to get your feedback on all that because you see from like, the time a kid picks up a stick for the first time to the next time he's in high school to the next time he's getting recruited to maybe he's in professional league. So you kind of can see how each person needs certain things to actually get to the next level or what would have been more important. Say you get a college guy come back, what's important or lacking because they didn't as a youth or as a high school athlete 
they didn't do any of the PE work or they really were not accustomed to foundational movements. And now we have to backtrack them a little bit. So that's kind of cool to hear. And I wanted to touch on a little bit since you did have a professional career and you, you said a few things yourself, like how your training was done. I mean, dealing with nicks and bruises and all those different injuries throughout it. Like how was that training? Like as you were going through like your coaching career and then now, like, what does your training look like now that you're kind of maybe you're still dealing with some injuries, but not necessarily like have to be on the game field all the time. So what what's kind of changed or what what are your kind of goals with your own training now? So now that I'm getting like I'm shifting away from playing. Um, so it's my career is basically solely coaching now. Um, so what I do in my own training is basically try out different methods that I'm going to apply to my kids. Um, so I've never given um you know, one of my athletes, something that I haven't went through myself um, just because I'm not comfortable teaching it. Um, I don't know the cues, you know, I don't know what the athlete's truly going through. And so if I'm blindly just coaching a movement or a method that I haven't experienced myself, like I don't feel comfortable doing that. So like recently I went through some triphasic training um, in the fall and the winter. Um, so I want to try that out, like finish Cal Dietz's book. I was like, this is really interesting. Before I try applying it with my kids, like I'm going to put myself through it. I'm going to understand, you know, what it feels like to do, you know, submaximal or super maximal loading for eccentrics and ISOs. Like, yeah, like if I don't know how much that sucks, like how can I even coach an athlete and understand what they're going through? Um, so now it's really just experimenting with myself. Like, yeah, I'm trying to keep myself healthy, um, not do anything too crazy. Um, make sure I can demo all the movements for my athletes. Um, so I think kids are very highly visual nowadays with, you know, everything they do on the tablets and phones and everything like they learn from watching. Um, and so I have to be able to, you know, perform those movements the right way. Um, Cause like monkey see monkey do, if I do the wrong thing, right. If I have a certain te technical flaw, like sometimes that just shows up in my athletes because they saw me do that. Um, and so I'm trying to keep myself in, you know, healthy, good enough shape where I can always demo things. Um, but I'm also looking at different methods um, to apply and, you know, try to at least try it on myself before I give it to my athletes and see if it's something that, you know, is going to work or, you know, I can kind of forget about. But recently it's been triphasic. Um, I'm starting to look at what's called it's push, pull. This is from Dr. Peterson. So the guy that wrote um, triphasic along with um, Cal Dietz. PCSP, I forgot what it stands for. Push, stretch, raise, pull, something. Um, mm, but it's me. a unique approach. I mean, it's he had a good lecture on um, Strength Coach Network that um, talked about energy systems and how to um, basically create certain, you know, programming or developing energy systems for your team that complements the coaching system. So in lacrosse center. It's like for us at Loyola, we're running gun kind of team. We love transition, pushing the ball, striking early offense where some teams, you know, will settle down six v six and play a slower game. Like depending on your system that the coaches are trying to implement, um, you're going to change how you develop your athletes energy systems. Um, and so that's why his lecture really um, got me thinking about trying this new method. Um, just seeing what works. You know, I'm basically a guinea pig for all my athletes at the end of the day. I like it. That, that's, that's a cool thing to hear though, but that, it's good advice to kind of, to understand that you are, you're kind of your own experiment with them, but to also understand that your demos can really play a huge role, especially in younger athletes or athletes with very low training age. I try to do the same thing. I, I need to be able to demo everything, but I also, I've, I've, I've found that using an upperclassman or someone that's been in the system for a while or someone I know is really good at that movement. I stole this from someone else. I demo it and try to explain it. And then I take it from, I make them demo it as well, because if the best kid on the team can do it um, and it's a teammate, then it looks a little bit more manageable rather than, right. Oh, well the strength coach can do it. Cause that's his job. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty, it's a, it, it works out pretty well, but you're right there. They, they vi visualize all the things and you can see it. Like, I don't, I think most kids are done with looking at whiteboards for plays. They don't want to see it. They, they want to go out and interact and do a walkthrough. And maybe some people learn that way and you can touch on it, but being able to demo something and get them in on the bar and feel it. That's, 
that's going to be your bread and butter for the most part. So you kind of, you touched on it a little bit, obviously you're, you're always continuing to learn either within your own training or trying different programs out. And um, you said like looking at strength coach network and everything, where, where else do you kind of go to either improve on the coaching side, strength conditioning side, or, or mental approach? Like where, what are your kind of go-to resources for continuing education for yourself? Um, so read a lot of books. Um, I've got about a stack of 10 books that I've started, haven't finished all of them, but like I'm reading bits and pieces, like um, just got the uh, constraints led approach to um, practice or whatever. I forgot what the full title of that name is, but just got that in the mail. Um, so reading, trying to, you know, read the foundational texts of our, um, of our field, or at least some of them, some of those Western, well, like transfer training by Bonder Chuck and, um, some of those books, that's a tough read, right? That's there. That's a hard one. That's a text. That's a textbook for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but strength coach network has been huge for me. Um, got that in the summer. Once I got this position, I was like, look, I got a lot to learn coming into my first year being a college strength coach and basically creating this whole system, right? Cause you come in, there's nothing, there's no groundwork that's been laid out for me going into this position because we have these independent contractors. Um, so I had to create a whole system. So strength coach network helped a ton with that. Um, hate to admit it, strength coach, Twitter, honestly, I learned a ton from the last year. Like as much bickering goes on and just stupid arguments, like there are some great follows that, you know, they'll just tweet out, you know, what they're, what they're thinking, you know, what their principles are, how they look at certain methods, you know, training different um, subpopulations where I've learned a ton from just, you know, colleagues in our field that have been open and, and willing to teach others. Um, so honestly, it's, it's just reading the right books. Um, you know, I'm probably not reading as much raw research as I did in grad school, um, but I'm still going to PubMed and, and looking up certain things. And, you know, if I'm really interested in a topic, like lately it's been accentuated eccentric loading over the last couple of months has like really um, kind of interested me. So like looking up John Wagle's work and um, Brad DeWeese's work. Um, but I mean, that's probably where I'm doing it from. It's, you know, grad school definitely teaches you some good knowledge, but it's more like the right questions to ask. That's what I took away from my master's degree. It's like where to ask these questions, what to ask. And then it's just learning on your own from there. Um, but Twitter, Strength Coach Network, books, PubMed, like those, those are my go-tos by far. Yeah, I think uh, you do a good job on Twitter. I think that was actually either that or some of the old pro guys from Loyola were the ones that first told me, they're like, hey, Manning's got, Manning's got the job at Loyola. I was like, oh, I better reach out. And I think you were getting ready for the test, and that was the first time I was like, yes, oh, yes. yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> Hey, it's, it's a one and done and just don't forget to renew it. That's all it is. So that's good. Hey, so uh, I wanted to touch on it too. Obviously, I know we're pretty lacrosse heavy with everything, but that's kind of your go-to. Um, for those that don't really know too much about lacrosse, they can learn the rules and everything on their own. But specifically within like your programming, are there any like drills or sports specific stuff that you add in the weight room or on the field or in the warm up or stuff that really are unique to the sport of lacrosse that you don't do with maybe any other athletes you have at the training lab? Like, is there anything that you add into the program that is like, this is this make or breaks like or, or defines kind of loyal lacrosse or just lacrosse in general that you think is pertinent to, or very important in your program? Not necessarily. I would say I steal things from other sports. Um, you know, when I was in grad school, I worked with, uh, Mike Morin over at next level athletic development, um, basically a baseball and uh, softball sports performance gym. You know, they have Raph Soto, they're calculating spin rate. They're doing, you know, all these things to improve pitching and, and hitting development. And so when I saw them truly do like a sports specific kind of take, what I stole from them was a lot of shoulder prehab work, being an overhead rotational athlete, um, how to, you know, teach proper rotation that's big in our program, you know, a lot of med ball work, um, teaching, you know, just the transfer of weight, you know, kind of the sequencing of rotational movements. Um, but none of that is specific to lacrosse. Like I'm taking that from, from, you know, hockey and, and baseball. Um, then I'm taking other elements from like rugby and football, like 
I think the cool thing about lacrosse is it's, it's a combination of other sports, right? You have, you know, the two man game, the pick game, um, the zone work of basketball, um, the footwork, defensive footwork and driving a basketball, um, you know, the free play and the flow of soccer and hockey, the physicality of football and rugby, um, you know, so you take all these little things from other sports and you see how they train them because I think lacrosse, you know, we're a relatively young team sport, you know, even though it's probably the oldest sport in history going back to the Native Americans, like as far as like what's been kind of grounded in culture over the last 50 years, like lacrosse is just, you know, kind of emerging. Um, so we haven't had a true sports performance like field for lacrosse. And so I think what's coming out now is like, we look at, you know, how soccer develops their energy systems. You know, there's a ton of great studies, you know, looking at GPS, you know, high steady duration distance, you know, the amount of low intensity, high intensity, accelerations, decelerations that all basically map out their programming. We don't have that in lacrosse just yet. Like we have one study from the Japanese men's national team playing Olympic rules that wore GPS units that gives us just a little bit of insight into the energy systems that we use in lacrosse. Otherwise, it's just eyeballing it. Um, so I still think we have a long way to go, but it's nothing that's novel to lacrosse. It's more, you know, what are the other sports that kind of mimic, you know, certain areas of the game? Like, what, how can we steal from them and apply what they're doing to, what, you know, to our program here to give us the edge? Um, so I, I guess that, that's the answer. It's like nothing novel. It's, it's learning from other sports and other coaches um, and things that, you know, apply specifically to lacrosse. Yeah, definitely. Just being observant. I mean, you, you're a student of the game and you played it yourself and at a high level and, and now you're kind of coaching it. So you know what bits and pieces you can actually steal that kind of complement it. And being such a young game, that's, that's something you need to do because there's not a lot of research on it. And I think a lot of times other sports, you'll probably see it if you work with any other like teams and organizations, like sometimes football just bastardized like what did the other what did the top team do what did this team do and you kind of get stuck in it rather than looking outside your scope of practice and finding what other sports what other coaches are doing maybe people that aren't even in the coaching profession like what are their opinions on it because that really sparks some out of the box ideas that really you can translate over and be on the cutting edge rather than just doing what the last team that had success did so uh, that's that's awesome to hear Hey, so uh, we end the show like any good training session, and this fits perfectly for lacrosse. We got four quarters, four questions, and I know you guys went to overtime recently, so we'll throw overtime in. And we'll, All right, we'll be on the we'll be on the good side of it this time. Unfortunately, I know that one hurt. Yeah, that one. I was watching that one. That one was. I felt for you guys. Happy game. I know. Hey, so uh, take as much time as you want, or you can fire them off rapid fire. But you ready? Yep, let's do it. All right, biggest influence in strength and conditioning and biggest influence in lacrosse or favorite athlete in cross. Oof, okay. Um, I've got to pick just one in strength and conditioning, huh? Um, honestly, I'd have to go back to Steve, right? He's, he's the first kind of intro to um, true strength and conditioning and got my career started off. So we'll go with Steve Gisselman for the first part of the question. Um, favorite lacrosse player. Um, we'll say Joel, uh, Joel White for Syracuse. Long stick midi, always kind of watched him through high school. Um, he did the things on the field that I couldn't do, which was score goals and look good out there. I was more clunky and hitting kids. So, um, I always love watching him play. Nice. Yeah. Those are com- two completely different styles, but oh, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're allowed, you were allowed in a Brett abrasive and just mm-hmm. always knocking into someone and always Not moving very fast, but you know, <laughs> I had my role. <laughs> hey, so what can you be found doing when you're not coaching or training? What are some of your go-to hobbies? I know you're pretty swamped, but what do you do when you got some downtime? Just chilling with my dog right now, especially through the pandemic, long walks with the pup around Fed Hill. Um, you know, watching Netflix, binge watching some sort of show, um, research and stuff. That's usually what I like to do with my free time. Like I love learning. I go through cycles, honestly. Like I'll have two, three weeks where I'm like digging into books. I'm using all my free time with that. But then there's a couple of weeks where I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to do anything. Like we'll see what's on TV. We'll relax. Um, we won't touch any literature. 
Um, so it goes in cycles, but you know, it's probably chilling with the dog, reading something, hanging with friends. That's about it. There you go. Hey, so if you weren't in the business of strength conditioning and coaching, what would you be doing? And um, since you did play pro lacrosse and you're kind of on the other end of the spectrum now, what sport would you have picked if you could go pro in anything else? Basketball, 100%. Um, as far as what I'd be doing if I wasn't coaching, probably making a lot more money um, doing anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honestly not sure. Like, I guess I wanted to be a doctor, but I, if I would have gone into medical school, maybe. Like, we'll go with that. But I couldn't see myself being stuck in a cubicle, cold calling, the office life. Like, that is not for me. I've got to be outside doing something else. So anything but that. that that's fair enough. All right, so if you set up an ideal training day for yourself, what's your go-to music on the station or PR song? And then what's your go-to best post-training meal after that? Okay. Um, well, we always start the day off with some country music. So get in a good mood. If it's going to be a PR song, like it's going to be, I don't know, maybe some Rage Against the Machines, something just that gets you going. Um, but I always have to be in a good mood going into a training session. So country music and then probably followed up with uh, hard rock or some rap. Um, is there any other parts of this question? Don't forget yeah, what's your, what's your go-to like that meal after that training session's over, you hit the, you just hit the PR. Okay. Um, whew, I better answer this question correctly. Cause my mom is a nutritionist. She's going to kill me. Um, Definitely eating some good complex carbs. Um, honestly, what I did through grad school that probably made me feel the best was just smoothies. Like a bunch of frozen fruit, protein powder, some good rolled oats, chia flax seeds, throw some spinach in there, boom. Just a nice smoothie. Because I can't eat a ton right after working out. Like I'm better at drinking liquids than just housing a bunch of solid food. So it'd probably be, it'd be a smoothie. I think she'll appreciate that answer. Yeah. Hey, so last, there. I hear you. <laughs> hey, last one I got for you for overtime. What is your favorite either playing memory or under the bar training memory? Um, favorite playing memory. Let's see. I can't say anything about my last game of my college career because we got destroyed in the final four. So maybe the game before that, going to the final four, we beat Towson in the shoe at Ohio State. Um, I crushed a kid in the fourth quarter, like two minutes left, just leveled him. It was a clean hit, but I got called for a penalty. But um, we ended up having a last like minute man down stand to win the game. Um, even though I was watching from the sidelines, that was pretty cool. I'd, I'd, I'd give going to the final four. My, my last year of college, that was, that was pretty special. I gotcha. I remember watching that game and we all joked. And I think even the announcers were joking. I think, yeah, because they showed the map. They're like, hey, this is how close Towson and Loyal are. Because what, we're like three miles away from each other. Yeah. And we both had to bus or fly, what, f almost 12,000 miles, like 1,200 miles away to Ohio State when we yeah. could have just like met in the middle somewhere and played a Hopkins. Yeah, played Hopkins, played <laughs> Edmonton Bank, like <laughs> made no sense. But it was pretty cool. It's my only time playing at the shoe. That's hilarious. Hey, so where can people kind of find you, follow you? You said you're active on, on Twitter, and that's a, that's its own web of take it or leave it in the strength. Those are own, uh, own little mini world. <laughs> that app. Yeah. Where can people get a hold of you, though, follow you, hear more about Peer Performance Lab and everything you got going on, though? Yeah, so we got two Instagram accounts. Um, one's my business, Pure Performance Lab LLC. Um, and then personal would be, I think it's D underscore Manning 19. Um, Twitter, uh, I think it's D Manning 19. There might be an underscore there. I honestly don't know my how to spell my so social accounts. Um, but then my website is pureperformancelab.com. Um, and that's basically where you'll find me. Awesome. Yeah, I'll put all the links in before. So uh, every, everybody will be able to find access to it. So, so no worries. You don't need to remember any of it, but perfect. Hey, it's, it was great to have you on, man. I know we haven't seen in a while and it, um, 
I mean, we first met when uh, you were playing and I think it was either after your injury or before it. And I mean, talking with all the guys that I trained that were a few classes above you, like you're always been a hardworking guy and you went right from rehab, right into the weight room right away. And David, like Schaefer was always like on you. It was like, he's, he's working again. And I think you came up and shared a few lifts with me. So it, it's been cool to see your progress and, and see your pro career and then get into the coaching. And it's, I'm glad to see someone's over at the helm, holding it down uh, up at Ridley. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey man, I appreciate you coming on today and, uh, and take care out there. Thank you, Nick. It was great catching up. Of course, man. See ya. All right. Take care. That's it for this episode of the strength game. Thank you again to this week's guest and to our sponsors, Cerberus Strength. Be sure to connect and keep up with our guests at the links in the description below. Remember to subscribe to us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast provider to stay up to date on all future episodes. Also, check us out on YouTube and CoachO'Brien.com, where you can find all the video versions of these episodes, as well as show notes, episode schedule, and much more. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome and appreciated. Thanks again for tuning in, and be sure to join us next week for another great episode of The Strength Game.